Welcome back. We've just talked about the first personal computer being the Altair, but it was a rinky-dink device that you couldn't really do much with except for toggle the switches and look at the lights. So now we're going to talk about what was in some ways the first personal computer for all of us, something you could just take home and use. And of course, that's the Apple computer. Steve Wozniak, the co-inventor of it, was one of those people at the very first meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club. A friend had shown him the flyer that said, if you're interested in doing these things, if you've been making electronic devices, come to the meeting on Wednesday night. And Steve Wozniak showed up. He was a very shy, very geeky kid whose father was an engineer at Lockheed, the aerospace company. And his father would take him to work and show him how to use all the components of electronics. He says, one, uh, Waz said, one of my first memories is, is, is my dad taking me to the workplace on weekends, showing me the electronic parts. And Wozniak figured out how to do Boolean logic in a circuit with on off switches and or gates, all of those things. He also studied computer manuals. This is when he's in early in high school, ninth, 10th grade, in order to design office computers using fewer chips. That was one of his specialties. He could make magic with very few microchips, which was important before Moore's laws kicked in and uh, microchips were expensive. He went to a school called Homestead High School and he was quite the prankster, even though he was so shy. He made a bomb once out of a metronome, one of those musical things that goes click, click, click and counts the beats in the music. Uh, it was, he put it, uh, it wasn't really a bomb, but it was supposed to look like one. He put it in his locker and let it tick. And when they broke open the locker, the headmaster found it, ran it into the field and threw it out. And then Wozniak and his friends were laughing. And he actually had Wozniak sent to the juvenile detention center for one night, during which Wozniak taught his other inmates how to take the electrical wires from the light socket and put them on the bars of the uh, cells so that they would shock the wardens when they came to open the doors. Uh, he goes down the street one day and meets a kid who's four or five years younger than him, Steve Jobs. And Steve Jobs was also at Homestead High School. Waz had just graduated. And Steve and he talked about things sitting on the curb in Los Altos, the town in Silicon Valley, a little bit south of uh, Palo Alto. Uh, in Los Altos, they'd sit on the curb and they'd talk about electronics. They'd talk about making uh, things. They'd also talk about Bob Dylan. They were infatuated with Bob Dylan. And they started going around trying to score the bootleg tapes you know, that people had made of Bob Dylan concerts. Uh, and they bonded over all the work they did together. Uh, Steve had grown up the adopted child of an uh, auto mechanic. His father had told him when they were making a fence around his backyard that you had to make the back of the fence just as beautiful as the front of the fence. And Steve said, why? Nobody will ever see it. Nobody will ever know. And his father said, yes, but you will know. And that was an important lesson in Steve's life. He said, my dad, he cared about doing things right. He even cared about the parts you couldn't see. And for Steve Jobs, and this you see in Apple computer over the years, beauty mattered, even the beauty of the parts you can't see. He was a perfectionist in that way. He goes off to read college, Steve Jobs does, and uh, it's an expensive school. He's doing it partly to stick it to his parents who could barely afford it. But finally, Steve drops out. But having dropped out, he just stays there at college anyway, living with friends. And it meant he said he got to sit in on the classes that he wanted to take instead of having to take the classes he didn't want to take. So he took classes in calligraphy and art and music and dance. Calligraphy, where he learned how to make beautiful fonts which is why the Macintosh had such great fonts when it finally came out. And he said, 
the minute I dropped out, I could do things that were interesting. And it allowed him to stand at the intersection of the arts and sciences, because he studied the arts, but he was a computer geek. In 1971, he and his friend Steve Wozniak come up with the greatest of pranks. It's called a blue box. Esquire magazine that year had written a story about if you create this electronic box and it has various tones to it, you know, boop, beep, 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 boop, and then you can make long distance calls for free if you figure it out. And Wozniak and Steve Jobs went to one of the libraries at Stanford, found the Bell System manual that they had tried to recall that told you how to make these tones. And Wozniak was able to make one that was digital and allowed you to hack into a pay phone, make the tones and do long distance calls. And so they do it. It's called the blue box. And they even try it out once calling the Pope in the Vatican and saying that they were Henry Kissinger. Fortunately, whoever it was who was answering the phones at the Vatican didn't really believe them. But the cool thing was the long distance call worked and they didn't have to pay for it. It was the start of a storied partnership. I mean, they're great partnerships in Silicon Valley. We talked about Bob Noyce and uh, Gordon Moore and Andy Grove, Hewlett and Packard or another, and of course, Bill Gates and, and um, Paul Allen will become one of those. But one of them was Steve Jobs and Wozniak, and they had very different talents. Steve Jobs was a marketer, somebody who knew how to make money off of things and knew how to make them beautiful, loved the design of products, whereas Woz was a hardcore engineer, especially a hardware engineer. So they pulled their talents, they started making the blue box, $40 worth of parts, and they could sell it for $150 a piece. Then at one point, uh, they're trying to sell it to somebody in the parking lot of a pizza joint, the person pulls a gun, takes their money, takes the blue box. And so they quit for a while trying to sell the blue box. But Steve Jobs later told me if it hadn't been for the blue boxes, it wouldn't have been an apple because it showed them how they could combine their talents where Waz would invent and engineer things and Jobs would figure out how to package them and market them. Uh, Steve Jobs ends up, after dropping out of college and doing the blue box, uh, getting deeply into Zen Buddhism and taking a pilgrimage to India to find his guru. Uh, his guru taught him many things, including to stare without blinking, which was, tr trust me, an unnerving talent that Steve had. He'd stare at people and say, don't be afraid, you can do it, or he'd mind mess with the people. When he gets back, he goes to work at Atari. Atari had just come out with the game Pong, making a lot of money. There were ads in all the local newspapers in Silicon Valley. They just said, have fun, make money. And then they showed you how to apply to Atari. Steve shows up at Atari dressed in a hippie garb, sort of a saffron robe from India. And he said he's not gonna leave the lobby until he got a job. Al Alcorn, the engineer, goes to the guy, Nolan Bushnell, I told you about, who was a person who owned the firm, and said, look, let's take a chance. Let's hire this guy. Steve was uh, not the easiest employee. He called everybody around him dumb shit, and he said their ideas sucked, and yet he had a certain charisma to him. He managed to be compelling in his saffron robes and walking around barefoot. In India, his guru had taught him if he ate only vegetables and grains and didn't eat meats or anything else, uh, then he wouldn't have body odor. And so Steve did not use deodorant and often didn't shower. Al Alcorn said that was a mistaken theory. So I put him on the night shift. Steve learned a lot, he said, at Atari, but mainly how to keep things simple. The great instructions, avoid ball, missing ball in order to get your high score, or insert quarter, avoid Klingons, no manuals. And Waz would come visit in the evenings, come visit from his job at uh, Hewlett Packard down the street where Waz was working. And uh, they got assigned, or Steve Jobs got assigned by Al Alcorn, 
to make a single version player of Pong. That's because Waz had already made one that you could use on a home TV set. And by assigning it to Waz, he knew that, uh, by assigning it to Steve Jobs, Al Alcorn knew that Steve would get Waz to help him. And indeed, they did the one player version of Pong. In fact, Steve Jobs told Steve Wozniak, you got to do it in four days so we can get back to the apple farm where they were working, hence the name of the company they end up founding. And Woz at one point said, hey, you got to be crazy. It can't be done in four days. Steve kept saying, you can do it. You can do it. Woz said, I know how to engineer things. You don't. It'll take me more than four days. Steve used that trick of staring without blinking. And he said, don't be afraid. You can do it. Woz said he just got so freaked out by that, he went back to his work and stayed up for three nights and ended up coding the game of Breakout. So he's there right after they finished the game of Breakout in March of 1975 at that first meeting of the Homebrew Computer Club. Woz goes by himself, having just finished the game, and everybody's talking about the new Altair. There's a copy of it there, it's on cover of Popular Electronics, but Waz is too shy to talk to people about it. He kind of sits in the back, has to introduce himself at one point when they call on him. He said he worked at Hewlett Packard and was working on video games. Uh, but they passed around a specifications sheet for the new Intel microprocessor. And Waz looked at it and he saw something that you and I probably wouldn't fully understand. He said he saw that it had instructions for adding a location in memory to the A register and then for uh, taking things out of uh, that memory uh, and subtracting the memory from it. He said, whoa, wait a minute, that's the most exciting thing to discover ever. Because he figured out you could use that little uh, ability, that little uh, uh, power of that microprocessor in order to help make an easier, better computer. And so he does, he takes a bad little video monitor like a small TV set and circuits and he takes the Intel 8080 microprocessor. And on Sunday, June 29th, working late at night, 1975, he types onto a keyboard, he's jerry wigged up to the uh, circuit board and then the video monitor. And he types in and boom, the letters he typed pop up on the video screen. As Waz said, it was the first time in history anyone had typed a character on a keyboard and seen it show up on the screen right in front of them. A keyboard and a monitor and a circuit had been integrated with a microprocessor and designed for an easy to make machine for hobbyists. Waz was too shy to stand in front of the Homebrew Computer Club at the next meeting and show off his device, but he stood in the back and he let people come see it. He had all the, the specifications, the schematics, the design for it, and he handed it out for free. I wanted to give it away for free to other people. That was the Waz mentality. That was not the Steve Jobs mentality. Steve Jobs, as with the blue box, Steve Jobs shows up at the Homebrew Computer Club with Waz, helps carry the video monitor that they're gonna to use to show it off. And Steve thought differently. He thought, we can build and sell these things. So Steve Jobs goes to the bite shop, a neighborhood computer store and says, we're willing to sell you this computer. And of course the owner said, fine, but they've got to all be assembled. You can't just sell me the components and think that people are gonna solder and you know, pull them together. I don't have hobbyists here, I have people who want computers. And so they did, they made an Apple computer that had everything integrated into it. And by the time they're doing the Apple II, the next version, Steve Jobs did not spend a lot of time worrying about microprocessors. He left that to Wozniak. Instead, he went to Macy's and studied the Cuisinart. And he said, 
how would you put it all together so somebody could just take it out of the box and it would work? Up until then, all these uh, computers that hobbyists were building, you had to put your own keyboard and connect it to the circuit. Then you had to get a monitor and connect it. He said, no, I want everything to be connected. That's the way the bike shop wanted it. And as Steve Jobs said, quote, my vision was to create the first fully packaged computer. We were no longer aiming for the handful of hobbyists who like to assemble their own computers. In other words, we're taking a huge leap here. It was no longer for the hobbyists and the hackers and the Heathkit building set. We were soon going to have a personal computer when you could have on your own and it would be for people who didn't want to assemble it themselves was going to be an all-in-one device. And so they do. They make the Apple II, which becomes hugely, hugely successful. The company goes public. Wozniak and Steve Jobs become rich. But even with the Apple II, there was one thing missing before it could become part of a true computer revolution. The screen, it didn't have an easy to use interface. It wasn't really simple for an average person to use it. You had to type in commands, you had to learn the commands. You had to know S for display slot assignments and T for set time and B for basic and tutors to explain it to you. It was all a rather intimidating user interface. And that leads us to the next step, a really huge leap in the personal computer and all computer revolution, which is easy to use interfaces, intuitive graphical user interfaces, unlike the one that was on all other computers at the time, all personal computers, and even the good selling Apple II. Thanks.